So welcome to this very high level video on what a VLAN is. In this video, we're gonna spend a few minutes covering off the theory, and then we're gonna dive straight into a practical demonstration. As with every way I like doing my videos, I like to give practical reasons in real world scenarios in when you would use uh, these different technologies because doing things in the classroom sometimes don't always relate to the real world. So what we're going to do is have a look at how VLANs uh, are set up or the reasons for them. We're going to look at how a VLAN is shown in a frame um, and then a packet. And we are then going to go into a practical demonstration where we're going to create a scenario where we've got a managed office like a Regis or something like that. And we've got one physical network, but we need to logically divide this network up into small segments so that we can rent out individual offices but don't have to worry about how each of these different offices configure their um, infrastructure so there's no way that the two offices can communicate with each other or indeed be in the same broadcast or DHCP zone. So what is a VLAN? A VLAN stands for virtual LAN or virtual or virtual local area network what it does is it allows you to logically break up a physical network into different segments. So one possible use is for limiting broadcast domains. If you have a very large network, you may wish to break it up logically into maybe accounts and engineering, account, uh, marketing, uh, IT. And we split those into individual VLANs, and that way we keep the amount of broadcasts that are sent out by individual computers into much smaller logical areas. Uh, but they can all still communicate to the server because we would we would configure the servers to talk uh, to all the different VLANs as required. And this can uh, greatly re reduce a quote noisy network. Another possible reason we may want to split up. Um, individual segments is if we had a an office like a Regis and we or we we're subletting part of our uh, our building out and we've got one physical network what we don't want to be having to do is worry about one uh, company setting up a network with uh, on one subnet and then another company having to use a completely different subnet so there's no chance that things like DHCP servers could inadvertently um, inadvertently send out uh, requests to the wrong company effectively. Also, um, we might want to have all these individual companies though still being able to access the internet. So in this case, we would configure our core switch or the switch that's on the firewall um, to have all the, to have access to all the different VLANs. So we give them a specific default gateway and that way they can get internet access but not in any way uh, risk communicating or, or crossing those VLAN barriers. Another reason why we would use VLANs is sometimes you may have a, a sensitive area in your network, such as payroll or your accounts department. And by putting a, them on a different VLAN, uh, it makes it impossible, um, practically impossible, for other computers on the network, other users, to accidentally um, cross over into that area where, where the data may be or be able to access information uh, potentially on those computers. Um, or on the servers that are dead, uh, serving that dedicated VLAN. Uh, another reason why we might have VLANs is we might want to have a lab environment, um, especially with VMware where you're able to just spin up copies of your production environment. You want to have a lab environment, uh, but what you want to do is not have to change all the IP addresses and risk the accidental uh, contamination where you've spun up a lab domain controller and it's starting to interfere with your production network and you've got to put it onto a different subnet. The easiest thing here would be to create a specific VLAN for your lab environment. And then what you can do is take a network port that's on your network port on one of your switches and configure that to the lab VLAN. And then you can plug a la uh, laptop or a computer into that and be able to access and test your lab environment as though you was on your production environment, but without contaminating uh, the two different VLANs. It's not, not uncommon to have an access point, a wireless access point in a building where you might want to have a guest network for your uh, clients that are turning up. And you might also want to have a Wi-Fi for your um, staff to connect their smartphones and another Wi-Fi. And when I say Wi-Fi, I mean an, an, an ID. You might want to have one that's live that you can connect laptops to. 
Uh, and then finally, you might want to have uh, cordless voice over IP phones that connect to the Wi-Fi. Now, all of these have completely different requirements. They may want to be segregated from the main network, but your access point only has one network point connection in it. So what we do is we would take each of these different um, IDs, of wireless IDs, and we would assign a different VLAN to them. Uh, these would be what's known as tagged VLANs. We'll come on to that in a minute. And we would configure the switch uh, to take all those multiple tagged VLANs. And then we can, I say root, root's the wrong word because we're not talking about routing. But what we can do is allow those different wireless IDs to different parts of our network. So we can have the client network on VLAN 2 connect out to maybe a, a broadband router, which is also on VLAN 2. Whereas we would have the live network, say on VLAN 1, and we would program the switch to take VLAN 1 and give it access to the production network. So it allows us in this instance to, to take something that has only one physical port, but provide multiple services off it. And one of the other uh, uses of VLANs is using quality of service. Now you can apply a quality of service um, to individual VLANs. And there are other ways of applying quality of service, but it's quite common to apply them to VLANs. Where you would use this maybe is if you've got a voice over IP network. For instance, you've got IP phones. You're not going to want to have switches dedicated to IP phones and switches dedicated to your IT network. But the problem you've got is while people may be tolerant to an email being a bit slow or Outlook taking a while to open up, people won't tolerate uh, bad phone calls or, or high latency audio. So what you need to do is be able to pro prioritise that traffic from your uh, IP phones over the traffic from your computers. And the way you would do this would be to put your phones on a separate VLAN and then you could apply quality of service. So effectively you're saying anything, say VLAN 2, has a higher priority when it hits the switch and will be um, switched before the computer network. This then becomes a little bit more problemsome when you want to have your computer network talk to your phone network, things like unified comms. And this is when you start having to uh, use routers to potentially route between the two VLANs or you can set up clever um, commands or within the switch, uh, which is outside the scope of this video. So, how does VLANs work? Well, VLANs sit at layer two of the OS model. And just have a quick recap for us that don't use the OS model every day. Um, we have the seven layers, um, and then we have the physical. We have the data link, which is where um, VLANs sit. And this is what we refer to as a frame. Um, and a frame effectively will accomplish a particular protocol um, and in the context of what we're talking about here, IP traffic, the data frame will encompass the IP packet. And then we go further up the, uh, uh, up the model where we you know, usual thing, TCP, UDP, right all the way up to the application, so um, FTP, HTTP, right up to, up to the top, top levels. So the data link layer as we can see here, encompasses the uh, destination source, and we're talking about MAC addresses at the data data level. Um, and you can see this is where the, the VLAN tag gets inserted in. And then this is where the, the data packet and ultimately where, sorry, the data frame, and where ultimately a packet of information where we'd have our uh, IP header, um, IP source, port information, and payload would sit would sit here. Okay, so we've, we know where our VLAN is in the ISO model. So we have two types of VLANs, or two, two methods of implementing VLANs. One that's called tagged and one that's untagged. Now, by default, switch straight out of the box, you plug your servers in, you plug your switches in, and you are actually already on a VLAN on most uh, decent switches, especially layer three type switches. You are gonna be on the default VLAN, and you're going to be on an untagged VLAN 0 or VLAN 1. So what is the difference between tagged and untagged? Right, it's pretty simple. 
tagged networks are used when you want to have more than one VLAN per physical port. An example is the wireless access point I just spoke about. In this instance, you have got the access point, multiple um, wireless IDs, lots of different jobs, one physical port. This has to be tagged. And the concept of a tagged VLAN is that the device that you are plugging into the switch has to be configured. And this makes sense. You have to configure in the wireless access point ID, each wireless ID has to be configured to a VLAN. So you have to physically do configuration on there and you have to do configuration on the port on the switch. The opposite of this is an untagged VLAN, and an untagged VLAN is where you just do the configuration on the switch. The device you're plugging into the switch, computer, phone, printer, is not VLAN aware, and it doesn't need to be. We'll come on to that in a minute. Another example, maybe in a tagged VLAN, is often um, IP phones. They will allow you to daisy chain with your computer. So you plug your phone into your network port and then you plug your computer into your phone. So we've already said that your phone network should be on a different VLAN to uh, mitigate against broadcast storms and to allow quality of service. The way we get around this is by we would make the, the port on the switch a tagged VLAN for the switch, sorry, for the phone. We would have to tell the phone and this can be done in a number of ways through special configurations on DHCP or, or manually setting up the phone. We have to tell the phone that it needs to be sitting on VLAN 2. And then the computer can be untagged on VLAN 1. But yeah, so there's no additional configuration needed for the computer. So in this setup, the switch would be a tagged VLAN 2 for the phone and an untagged VLAN 1. Now each port on a switch can only have one and untagged VLAN. If you're not configuring a device that plugs into it, how would it know which VLAN to associate it with? So the example of where you would have tagged VLANs um, is firewalls. Um, you may only have one physical port on the firewall, but you may want to um, be having DMZs and uh, lab environments, etc. So you can create all your virtual um, rules and stuff based on VLANs. Wireless access points, we've covered that many times. Trunks, so here's a good one. You might have multiple VLANs that are all untagged on a switch uh, because you want your payroll on one and you want your, your accounts on another. And so they're all untagged VLANs because you're only plugging one computer into the port on the switch. So you'd have accounts uh, untagged VLAN one and payroll uh, untagged VLAN two. Now that switch, you need to use an uplink cable to go to your core switch where your servers are, are connected. Now we think about this logically. We need to send the data from the accounts department and the data from the payroll department has to be sent from your edge switch up to your core switch. And we'll always do this through an, an uplink cable. It could be fiber, it could be 10 gigabit. Um, we call this a trunk because we're putting all the information on there. Now to take the information over one port on the switch, we need to basically have it tagged. So the VLAN for the payroll and the VLAN for the accounts department, although it's untagged on the, on the switches that connect to the computers, on the trunk it has to be tagged. Why? Because we're going back to here, we're trying to do more than one thing per physical port. We're trying to put the payroll data down, we're trying to put the accounts data down, one physical link, therefore it has to be tagged. And we will cover this in the practical demonstration. Um, and I've already covered voice over IP. I've pretty much already said this, but basically, untagged VLANs, there's no configuration needed on the device end. Only one device per port, 
and the device that you plug into there doesn't have to be VLAN aware. There's lots of devices that you can't configure VLANs on. Um, for instance, I know that the Dell SonicWall um, SSL VPN connections, um, those appliances, not VLAN aware. So it would have to go on untagged VLAN. And of course, uh, untagged VLANs, you're much less likely to make a mistake. And of course, simple to set up. Right, so let's just go over what I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, so maybe visuals will help here. So we've got the access point, we've got VLAN 1 and VLAN 2, two SSIDs. And of course, two things, one port have to be tagged. Um, our live network here wants to go to our server here. Now our server is not VLAN aware, and as you can see, it's an untagged VLAN 1. Because we're only doing one thing, which goes into this port, so we've configured that to be untagged VLAN 1. This computer needs to not be configured, but up here in the configuration screen for the SSID, we have to configure and tell it what VLAN 1 and VLAN 2 is. Sorry. Down here we've got a little um, guest, uh, broad, we've got a little broadband connection, little domestic BT broadband, and this is to allow our guest Wi-Fi straight out. So we can, uh, we, there's no special configuration because it's domestic broadband, uh, so we have to put this on an untagged VLAN 2. So where the tagged comes in with 2, and it will come along here and out the firewall, the tagged 1 will come along here and hit the file, and hit the, uh, file server. And these two will never talk to each other. Example 2, accounts department server, or accounts department here. These are all on an untagged VLAN 1, and these normal staff are all on untagged VLAN Sorry, these are VLAN 2, this is VLAN 1. And likewise, your servers here, untagged, untagged. There is no configuration needed for any of these devices. It's only the switch that needs to be configured, which we'll cover in the uh, practical. And in this, this way, this can never talk to that, and that can never talk to that. And final visual uh, representation of uh, the trunked setup. So you've got the accounts, again, Perfect, untagged, no configuration needed here. Normal staff, untagged VLAN 1 again. All the information has to be sent up to this switch. So this trunk here has to be tagged 1 and 2 because we're putting both sets of information along the one path. This again port here will be tagged 1 and 2. And then we can have these ports configured as an untagged VLAN 2. So these computers need no configuration. And finally, untagged VLAN 1, normal staff, no configuration needed. And the final um, example before we go on, computer here, daisy chain with phone. This port here is going to be tagged with VLAN 2 and untagged on VLAN 1. So this needs no configuration because it's untagged. This will need configuration either by setting the IP address statically up on the phone, or by using fancy DHCP. Right, time to move on to the practical. So now we can put to practice some of the theory we've been learning about VLANs. This is the situation. We've got one physical network with one switch, three physical PCs that are all connected to that switch. The scenario is that we are running a managed office, like a Regis, and we provide network points for people to come in and rent out offices. The scenario is that we have two offices, all connected to the same network, and one company is going to have two physical PCs, and the other company is going to have one physical PC, but they're all going to plug into the same switch. We don't have to buy a physical switch because as companies move around, move out of the uh, managed offices, some companies expand, some companies shrink, it just takes away the flexibility of having to provide physical switches to each individual company and also will make it difficult if we then supply an internet backbone. So, we have three physical PCs that are connected to the switch. This is PC1 on company one. We've got PC2 belongs to company two. And we've got PC3 that belongs to company two. And we have access to the physical switch. We can see, if we look at our switch from the web interface at the moment, 
that number port 13, port 17 and port 19 are the three ports that these pieces are connected to. We're going to take the imaginary scenario at the moment that both companies, for some reason, set up their IP addresses in such a way they're on the same subnet, but they all have different static IPs. If we bring up company two, which is on PC3, we can see that this completely separate company, but because it's plugged into the same switch, can obviously ping company one of company one's PC. From a security perspective, this is really bad. If we bring back PC one in company one, well obviously they should be able to ping all the PCs on their network. So if we go and ping the other PC, which is 20.51, we can see that PC one and PC two for company one can ping each other. But we can also see that PC1 for company 1 can also ping PC3 for company 2. So at the moment, the biggest problem is that we would have to manage and tell people what IP addresses they can use so there's no conflicts. But even worse, the issue is of security because they could access potentially each other's files. Now, obviously, these two companies in the real world wouldn't be talking with each other. So what happens if... For some reason, company one sets up PC one and they decide to choose whatever IP address. It doesn't conflict with other PCs on their network. They decide to choose IO52. I'm going to lose connection to my remote desktop, obviously. So the network administrator for PC one on company one has set an IP address and he's been given this IP conflict. But hang on. There's no other PCs on his network with the same IP address. Why is it conflicting? Now, of course, if we have this is just with three PCs, but if we have a building that have hundreds of PCs in, this is much more likely to be a problem. Even worse, if we start having DHCP servers from each uh, company, this is going to start to affect each individual companies with DHCP servers issuing addresses to other uh, other companies, or more likely, the DHCP services will stop because. Um, they've detected more than one DHCP in that subnet. So, a couple of ways we can fix this. One, we would assign each individual computer an IP address, but this greatly takes away the flexibility in the service that we're offering our clients. So I'm just gonna set this IP address back to one that doesn't conflict. And re-establish a connection. So our remote desktop to our three PCs. The, clearly the option is going to be to carve this network up into VLANs. And we've spoken about untagged and tagged VLANs in the past. So an untagged VLAN, if you remember, means that the device that we plug into the switch doesn't need to be configured to use that particular VLAN. The downside of this is that only one particular device can be associated with that particular port. When we tag, a particular VLAN, we can have multiple interface interfaces through one physical port, such as if we were using a router or for the internet. But of course, this requires configuration on our equipment. Now, as this is a managed office, we don't want to have to tell people they've got to configure their switch uh, their computers with VLANs, etc. So we want to handle the management ourselves. So what we're going to do is split company one and company two up onto two different VLANs. And what we can do is we're going to open up our switch and we're going to do this through a the web interface. So this is a standard HP 2910, bog standard interface that allows VLANing. So the first thing we're going to do is actually set up our VLAN IDs. Now you always have your default VLAN and you don't really want to be messing around with this too much because we could lose connectivity to the switch. The switch will generally always sit on, on the default VLAN, which is VLAN 1. So we're going to create a new VLAN, uh, one for each company. So we can create our first one and call it VLAN 10. So we can give this an ID of 10, and this is what we're going to call this company one. And we're going to save it. So 
and we're going to create another VLAN. And then VLAN 11, and we're going to call this company 2. And you get the idea, we'd create a VLAN for every company that's in the building. The next thing we need to do is go to the specific ports that are on the switch and associate them with the VLAN. So, company one is running PC one and two. So this is company one, PC one, and I just wanna show you, so open up a couple of command prompts. Right, we're gonna ping PC two for company one. And keep that pin going. Okay. So PC1 is pinging in this screen PC2 for company 1 and it is also pinging PC3 that belongs to company 2, nothing to do with this whatsoever. So, we select our VLAN, company one, and we click ports. We select our port, and you can see we can change here, tagged, untagged, or forbidden. Now, as I said, we're gonna create this as an untagged port. This means we need to make no configuration changes to the switch. We're gonna pop, we're gonna change that one, and we're gonna save. one you can see it's already got one port 13 we're going to hit change and we're going to go pc2 and we're going to make this tagged uh, untagged and now we're going to untag company 2 to vlan 11. So come down to our ports hit change find our PC3 and we're gonna, which is part of company two, we're gonna hit untag and we're gonna save. Now if we click on each of these VLANs, we'll see the summary, port 13 and 17 are in an untagged VLAN 10 and company two is an untagged VLAN 19. Now these PCs are in their own separate VLAN. Let's go and have a look and see what impact this has had. So we now switch back to PC1 on company one. And we can see that it can now ping PC2 with no problems, but it can't ping PC3 anymore. If we look at PC2, bring up a command prompt here. It can ping PC1. But as you can see, it, no, it can no longer ping PC3. And finally, if we bring up PC3, if we ping PC1, it can't see it. PC2, it also can't see it. Now, if we go back to PC1, you remember earlier when I set PC1 to the same IP address as PC3, which is dot 52, we got an IP conflict. So let's do that again. This time we see no issue with a PC with an IP conflict. Now, obviously, this is all of a sudden started being pingable because it's effectively pinging itself. 
What we can see though is it is still pinging PC2 of the company. Now if we swap over to PC2, PC2, company one, we can now ping Fifty-two, which a moment ago was unreachable, but now it's pingable, and that's because we changed the IP address of PC1 to dot fifty-two. Now, to prove I haven't done anything funny, if we go back to look at PC3 and just do an IP config, we can see clearly this is also dot fifty-two. So the fact we separated these out onto two separate VLANs has meant that the two computers that just cannot see each other and we can run their only entire IP structure, DHCP, etc. And there was no special configuration required on the PC because they were marked as untagged VLANs. Now just to reiterate all of this, I'm just going to go back and change PC1. So we can now see that PC1 has had its IP address set back to 50. It, as we know, can ping PC2 which is on 51, but it can't ping PC3, which is on 52, which is in a different VLAN. Put these side by side. So what happens if we want to move PC2 from company one to be PC2 for company two? Well, we bring up PC2 we can see that it can ping PC1 because it's all part of the same VLAN, the same company. And if we ping PC3 for company two, it can't see it. So what happens now if we want to move this PC into the same network as company two? Well, let's go back to our switch. If we go back to company one. We can see it's got port 13 and 17. We've got company two in VLAN 11. It's got port 19. Now what we want to do is move PC2 into company two. Nice and easy. Pick up PC2 and we mark it as untagged. We go back to company one, we can see that only port 13, which belongs to PC1, is in untagged VLAN 10. And we can see now company two has port 17 and port 19, which we know is PC2 and PC3 physically, in the untagged. The question that may be asked is why did it take it out of one untagged VLAN to move it into the other untagged VLAN? As we said before, a PC can only belong to one untagged VLAN at a time. So, if we now go back to PC2, lo and behold, it can no longer talk to PC1 because we moved it out of that VLAN, but it can talk to PC3 of company two because it's been moved into that VLAN. So here we've got this idea of how we can move PCs around in and out of VLANs and to some extent protect them from each other. It should be noted that this is not the ultimate form of security. You could manipulate headers on packets to fake different VLANs and, and move across. So, you know, in that kind of environment, you'd be expected to secure your network with traditional security measures, firewalls, etc. But what this will do is put a good foundation of security in place where you at least segregate out those different networks.